of China Evergrande Group spiked sharply within the first hour of trade. It is now up 6-7%. Its subsidiary Evergrande Property Services also seeing strong gains in Hong Kong trade. So far, the troubled property giant has avoided default on public dollar bonds, but the crisis at Asia's largest junk bond issuer is hardly over. Evergrande is still grappling with more than $300 billion in liabilities. Bogged down by massive debt pile, the Shenzhen headquarter developer has been trying to dispose of its assets to raise cash. A string of other Chinese developers have also fallen into distress amid a crackdown on speculation and leverage following years of debt-fueled expansion. Singtel has more than doubled its net profit for the half year ended September. Its improved earnings mainly driven by the resumption of business activity across the region and also by the strong turnaround in its Indian associate Airtel. Net profit for the period rose to 954 million Sing dollars. The telco's group's operating revenue also up 3% to more than 7 billion Sing dollars, getting a boost from higher mobile service sales in Australia. Singtel Group CEO Yuan Kuang Moon says despite the continued uncertainties from COVID-19, the results show Singtel has entered an improved period of recovery. The company says it's making headway in its rollout of commercial 5G services, as well as its divestment of its Optus Tower assets. Looking ahead, Singtel says the coronavirus will continue to weigh on business in the region, but that improved vaccination rates will contribute to the resumption of more business activity. Shares of the Singapore telco giant Singtel is up by four-tenths of one percent. Earlier, they were under some sell-off pressure upon the announcement of its earnings results. And downbeat sentiment also um, was seen earlier in the broader STI uh, market. It is now up by a tenth of one percent. And that is the latest in business. Back to you, Glenda. All right. Thanks, Pam. Now, here's a look at some of the other stories that we're tracking for you on CNA Digital. Japan's new foreign minister says it's important to build constructive, stable relations with China. He's also calling for responsible behavior from Beijing. And this comes despite Japan becoming more outspoken, questioning China's assertiveness on issues such as the disputed South China Sea. Chinese social media giant Tencent says it expects Beijing to allow metaverse virtual environment services to operate in China. But it must obey China's rules and may need to be a different version to the rest of the world. At least 25 people have been killed and thousands of homes destroyed after heavy rains hit Sri Lanka and South India. Authorities are asking those affected to stay with relatives instead of government-run relief centres to reduce the risk of COVID-19 spreading. A study has traced the origins of the family of languages including modern Japanese, Korean, Turkish and Mongolian. It was traced back to millet farmers who lived in northeastern China about 9,000 years ago. The findings show a shared genetic ancestry for millions of people. And Mickey Mouse is venturing into the metaverse. Walt Disney CEO says the entertainment conglomerate is preparing to make its technological leap into a virtual reality world first imagined by science fiction writers. And you can keep up with news in Asia and beyond 24-7 on CNA Digital. And up ahead on Asia now, a spat between the current and former Prime Ministers of Australia over its approach to a rising China. And later, the UK's notoriously wasteful fashion industry under pressure to go green. A health catastrophe has wiped out the dreams of millions in India. Students have dropped out of school and are pushed to the margins of society. 90 million children don't have a future, what will happen to our country? Can India save its young and vulnerable before it's too late? Asia's lost generation, India. Insight, tonight on CNA. A novel cancer test kit. It's a new technology, it's new biology. We didn't have anything to benchmark. A unique portable hand soap. The idea can really motivate kids to wash their hands by themselves. A cutting-edge aquaculture research centre. This evolution is very fast and this uh, speed is impressive. How is Singapore innovating for the future? 
Becoming a Global Hub, Friday on CNA. Brought to you by the Trade and Industry. A century's old history gives us an understanding of where China's future lies. I'm Olivia Young, CNA, Beijing. Turning trash into a message. This time, to the artists can change the mindset of the peoples. Planting to absorb carbon. Building a more climate resilient community. Actually, the baseline of what we're doing is to support the fishermen and the wider community. Asia's climate warriors. Saturday on CNA. Biodiversity is booming, which is inviting for some local foragers and farmers who embrace edible wildlife. We're the largest organic banana grower in Singapore. This is wow. a gem. Amazing. Yeah. So the mulberries are from the garden. Oh, no, that's delicious. Singapore is ramping up conservation efforts locally and across the region. I really do love reptiles and finding out about them, so I really love my job. Building must relate to the lives of the people. There are those who dare to be different who have made their mark in Singapore and beyond. You have such big dreams, you know, you want to change the world with your art. Obviously, every fighter wants to win, so all you can do is to prepare yourself to win. Updating the Zawa's top stories, Chinese President Xi Jinping warns against a return to Cold War divisions in the Asia-Pacific. A surprise move from the world's two biggest polluters. The US and China pledge to cooperate on climate action. A rare statement from the UN Security Council. It's calling for an immediate end to fighting in Myanmar. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has hit back at former leader Paul Keating's assessment over his handling of relations with China. Mr Keating criticised the escalation of tensions with Beijing, saying Australia's foreign policy has lost its way. Mr Morrison says Mr Keating could not see things clearly. The former Prime Minister says China does not represent a contiguous threat to the country, adding that China is simply too big and too central to be ostracised. Mr Keating's comments come after Australia recently announced a security pact with the US and UK in what's seen as an effort to counter China. Now, he also said that Taiwan is not a vital Australian interest and Canberra should not intervene on this matter. Beijing has urged the Australian government to reflect on its approach. Roger Maynard has more on Mr. Keating's remarks on Australia's foreign policy towards China. Very scathing, I must say. Australia's relations with China have nosedived uh, in recent years, sparking uh, a political standoff and, and a trade embargo. And while Mr Keating is no apologist for China, he was very critical of uh, the rest of the world for the way it's been treating China. Uh, he took a swipe at almost everybody. And he claimed that Australia had lost its way and was at odds with its geography. He also took aim at the spooks in Australia's national security agencies for Australia's foreign policy towards China. Uh, national security experts 
have been growing increasingly concerned about China's perceived uh, aggression towards uh, Taiwan. So there was a lot to uh, discuss here, and Mr. Keating certainly didn't hold back. He said to begin with that uh, Taiwan is not a vital Australian interest. Uh, he said we have no alliance with Taipei. There's no piece of uh, paper sitting in Canberra which has an alliance with ta Taipei, he said. We do not recognize it as a sovereign state. We've always seen it as part of China. Uh, ANZUS commits uh, to consult under an attack on U.S. forces, but not an attack by U.S. forces, he said. Mr. Keating's view is Australia should not be drawn into a military engagement over Taiwan. And he said the only time the Chinese will attack or be involved in Taiwan is if the Americans and the Taiwanese tried or declared a change in the status of Taiwan. So, you know, that, that's his view. It's not a, a view, of course, that um, many in Australia would agree with, particularly uh, uh, in, in, in politics. And uh, that's certainly, um, his, he, he has a very big picture view of the world, Keating, it has to say. But within that big, big picture are many controversial views which the, uh, the, the majority of people, certainly in Australia, don't always agree with. Fossil fuels taking much of the flack at the UN Climate Change Summit in Glasgow. A draft agreement is calling for an end to subsidies for planet-polluting energy sources and for coal to be phased out. Some environmentalists see that as progress, but they also want governments around the world to tackle a climate threat on land, at sea and in the air. Plastic pollution. Avril Hong has more. Scientists in recent weeks have urged politicians to remember that we are in the midst of a plastic waste crisis. They fear emissions reduction policy is hogging the spotlight and that the plastics issue is being sidelined at a time when we need to take immediate action to reduce plastic consumption. A recent study says plastic pollution and climate change are not separate. Instead, both issues are actually intimately intertwined and each makes the other worse. Manufacturing of plastics adds to greenhouse gas emissions. In 2015, emissions from plastics were 1.7 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. That figure is projected to balloon to 6.5 gigatons by 2050. Extreme weather events brought about by rising temperatures are also responsible for worsening the plastic crisis. Floods, typhoons and hurricanes disperse plastic pollution in the sea. On top of the millions of pieces of plastic trash humans have already tossed into the oceans. Plastic currently accounts for a whopping 85% of all marine litter. A recent assessment from the United Nations Environment Programme says plastic pollution is on course to double by 2030 and triple by 2040. This amounts to 23 to 37 million metric tons of waste entering the ocean per year. As if dealing with the double whammy of climate change and worsening plastic pollution is not enough, the onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic brought with it a deluge of personal protection equipment, also known as PPE. A study conducted by Nansing University found a staggering amount, around 26,000 tons of pandemic-associated plastic waste floating in our seas. This includes millions of single-use medical masks and gloves. They added a vast majority of the PPE plastic waste came from countries in Asia where there are high levels of mask wearing by individuals. Even without the pandemic, Asia contributes the most to plastic pollution in our waters. 81% of all ocean plastic comes from the continent, mainly due to poor waste management. The Worldwide Fund for Nature's Global Plastics Policy Manager tells us how global players can turn the tide on plastics pollution. Plastic, coal and uh, uh, gas and, and any fossil fuel is part of the same problem. Virgin plastic is uh, made out of fossil fuels and uh, creates uh, CO2 emissions throughout the life cycle from the production of, uh, of virgin plastic materials, plastic products, 
throughout to the waste management, incineration. The main problem is that the plastic life cycle today is uh, designed uh, as being linear. That means that products are designed to become waste at the end of life. We need products that are actually uh, designed for being reused. We have to create what we call a, a circular economy, both for plastics and for all other materials, because uh, all materials will have some form of environmental footprint, even though it's uh, especially worrying to see the environmental footprint of plastics. Many countries in Asia are among the hardest hit by the plastic pollution uh, crisis. That also means that those countries will be the one who can benefit the most from uh, solutions and solving this problem. The plastic pollution crisis being completely unregulated uh, at the global scale is a, is a big concern, especially for Asian countries. And I think we need to create global rules uh, that, that, that can harmonize, uh, create global bans for some products that we don't need. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is calling on all nations to do more to counter climate change. But people in Britain say he needs to do more to make one industry in particular go green, and that's fashion. Chris Jones reports. The fashion industry is the UK's largest creative industry, and competition on the high street and online is fierce. The high level of demand means that brands must keep up with the latest trends, churning products out as quickly and in some cases as cheaply as they can, whilst maintaining a profit. That uses a lot of resources and creates a lot of wastage. The majority is either incinerated or sent to landfills, which creates damaging greenhouse gases. Charities like Trade are aiming to reduce the damage. At this large warehouse in North London, volunteers pick out items that otherwise would have been thrown away by retailers and members of the public and send them back out into the world for a second lease of life. Trade has put 160 million pieces of used clothing back into circulation via its network of second-hand clothing shops. And the charity's CEO, Maria Shenoweth, says this process is important for the environment. We buy 33 million items of new clothes and we throw into the rubbish 11 million items of clothing each week here in the UK. Trade is one of the many organisations doing all it can to make a difference in the industry. But without more facilities like this one, landfills will continue to expand. In fact, experts estimate that around 350,000 tonnes worth of used but still wearable clothing ends up in landfill every year. And it's estimated that the UK government could save around four.